This is Jeff Morris. I'm the chapter director for the Redwood chapter of the Sierra Club and uh, our apologies on the, the delay here. Uh, we're going to get started and um, the, we're doing our best to live stream this to Facebook as well. Um, so um, we're going to work that detail out, but uh, get going for the people that are joining us here on Zoom. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the second in what will uh, likely be a longer series of um, uh, web presentations on uh, fire and forests, land use, climate, wildfire, um, of that whole cadre of uh, conjoined issues. Um, we had a great uh, session last Friday on sh in showing a, a movie um, surrounding uh, wildfire uh, in communities and forests. And uh, we're going to follow that up today for um, a cutting edge uh, community forum on wildfire resilience. Uh, that will feature a presentation by Alexander Sippard, um, PhD, who is focusing on recent wildfire trends in California, uh, comparing the roles of climate change and land use change in altering fire patterns, uh, and the importance of land use change and wildfire risk to human lives and property. Dr. Sippard is a chief scientist at uh, Virtus Wildfire, also an associate with the Conservation Biology Institute, and an adjunct professor at San Diego State University. She has spent more than two decades analyzing the ecological and social drivers and impacts of landscape change, particularly focusing on wildfire and how to balance fire risk reduction with biodiversity conservation. Uh, her presentation will be followed by an expert panel discussion. Uh, and our panelists include uh, Lenya Quinn Davidson, who's the area fire advisor for UC Cooperative Extension here in Northern California. Uh, Dr. Frank Abley, who's uh, works uh, with the U.S. Forest Service on the Mendocino National Forest, and Terry Shore uh, of the Greenbelt Alliance. And uh, the uh, panel will first um, kind of do their own Q&A with, with uh, Dr. Shippard and, and talk through the presentation. And then we're going to open it up for uh, you folks to populate the chat box. And you can during the presentation as well. We'll be monitoring that uh, with your questions. Um, of uh, either individual panelists or uh, the panel as a whole. So um, looking forward to this and we will get started here right now. So without further ado, uh, Alex, you wanna take it away? Sure. Um, so I trust everybody can hear me and see my screen. Is that correct? Yes, you're good. Okay, okay. so I originally gave a version of this presentation to the Sierra Club Cal or uh, California Conservation Committee. And it was a statewide meeting and it was right before they passed a policy resolution, or I should say you, uh, to limit development in the CAL FIRE's very high fire severity zones. And so this talk was focused on land use change and it was also, uh, can't get my, um, oh, okay, there it goes. It was focused on, um, it was right at the beginning of the fire season. And so I was thinking about the fire season and that was my point of reflection. And so I invoked the song by Pete Seeger, There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And at the time I had had this slide up and fire season was well underway. There were um, almost a million acres burned. There had already been fatalities and structures burned. But as the season progressed, we are now today, um, as we're talking, looking at almost 10,000 fires so far in 2020. Uh, record breaking, more than 4 million acres have burned. Many structures and lives have been lost. And of course, there's been an unbelievable amount of prolonged thick smoke covering the state of California for much of the season. And fires are still burning. There are a couple fires burning in Southern California right now. So um, this seems particularly ominous because it's right on the heels of recent events of destructive fires, fires like Coffee Park, fires like Paradise in the last few years. And so, um, you know, it's, it's no wonder that folks are starting to question whether or not we've got this, you know, so-called new normal going on in California. And you see it all over the media, you hear people talking about it. It's a new normal, it's a new normal. 
or some people say it's the new abnormal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with fires in California, give you a little bit of perspective on the trends that we've seen, uh, just, you know, show, show some of the research that I and my colleagues have been doing investigating the causes of changes in wildfires, try to figure out what it is that's changing and why it's changing, and then end up with some strategies to um, to try to live with these changes. So in terms of what people believe, in terms of this new normal or the, um, the, fires, are, the fires are getting out of control, um, a lot of people think that they're getting bigger. You know, fires are getting bigger. And the question is, is this actually true? And if you look at fires in recent years, we've seen them in the media with the biggest fires in 2017 and 2018. But if you look over time, you can see going all the way back to 1889, we've always had large fires in California of approximately the same scale of fire. But what you see in this timeline here going from 1889 to 2018, is that there were four of these events within about a hundred period, a hundred year period of time, but beginning in 2003 through 2018, we've had nine of those events within 15 years, and now looking at Cal Fire's accounting of the largest fires in California, we are adding to that list very rapidly with 2020. So, is it true? Well. Fires in and of themselves are not actually getting bigger, but there are more frequent large fire events. The other thing I would like to point out though, when we're talking about the large fires, when fires are referred to as complexes, it doesn't necessarily mean they're all geographically the same place. So this is an example of the LNU complex fire that happened this summer, and you can see all three of these um, fires here are part of the same fire. So they get added up into the area burned for that one fire. And uh, my colleague Mark Schwartz and I have been looking at trends in area burned in different vegetation types over time. And you can see that in the last 70 years, there has been an increase overall in area burned, particularly in conifer and shrubland vegetation types. So the other common belief when people are worried about and talking about the new normal is, well, fires are much more destructive than they used to be. So is this true? And one way to think about this is to look at some maps. What I've got here on the screen, this is a map of San Diego County, um, west of the mountain range. And this here in yellow is urban development in 1940 in the county. And what you see in red are fire perimeters that span that decade. So fire perimeters from 1940 to 1950. And you can see in this decade, there were plenty of fires burning, but also in this decade, there were no structures lost to fire. There were no lives lost to fire. Now, if we go forward 60 years, you can see the map has changed a little bit. Area burned has increased by 36%, but the overwhelming change is the area of development, which increased 871%. And so in this decade, there were more than 5,200, and there were many lives lost and injuries and other costs of the wildfires. And of course, if we look at the numbers of recent seasons, uh, 2017 and 18, these single fire events have resulted in enormous numbers of fire lost just within single fires. And if we look at the data over time, these numbers come from Cal Fire. You can see that beginning in about the 1990s, structures lost have been increasing. This marker is approximately where we are this year in 2020. Okay. So if this is the new normal, I want to spend just a, a couple of minutes talking about what the old normal is in terms of California and other regions. 
So California obviously is a big state. It's a very diverse state. You have a whole lot of topographic and um, elevational variability. You have large variability in ecosystem types and vegetation types. And if you think of these together, they result in differences in the spatial patterns of fire across the state. So fire is not equal across the state of California historically. This is, by the way, a historical fire count. So the red areas are areas that have burned more frequently than the blue areas. And the reason for this is that different regions have what we call fire regimes. And a fire regime is basically a word to describe the average characteristics of fire, such as the frequency, the severity, the intensity, the seasonality over time. And ecosystems are adapted to these long-term ranges of variation with fire. Um, different plants and animals, um, you know, are adapted to living with these uh, fire regimes. So in California, there's a wide variety of them, going from uh, dry mixed conifer forests that historically experienced very frequent low-intensity fires to the chaparral shrublands that has historically experienced um, more infrequent fires that are high severity naturally, all the way to deserts that have infrequent fire. And so fire regimes in terms of whether they have been altered, it's something that happens over a longer period of time and it's related to the ecology of the region. And it's also related to the reasons why fires are changing. So we have something interesting going on in California. Uh, on the left map here, you see in green, this is sort of that um, dry mixed conifer forest zone in the Sierra Nevada. And down here, we've got the South Coast um, coastal shrublands. And what we have experienced is that in these forests, there has been a reduction in fire frequency over the last century. And part of that has been due to effectively keeping out of the keeping fires out of forests that historically burned very frequently. But if you look at the southern part of the state, that's not happened. Fires have not been kept out of that region. And in fact, the orange is showing that we have an interval departure that is positive, that we have way more fires now than we used to have. And part of that is because a lot of these fires are wind driven. Uh, they're a little more difficult to suppress, and there's a lot of population, uh, so people are starting fires in the southern part of the state. So in summary about the new normal and whether fires are changing, we can say first, it's important to remember that fire regimes form over space and time, and fire and fire regimes across the state are tied to their ecological context. So changes in one area do not necessarily apply to the other. But we do see clear trends. We are having more frequent large fire events. Our fires are becoming more destructive in terms of human costs. And we are seeing a trend in area burned increasing. So obviously to address this challenge, we need to understand why this is going on. And there are many complex reasons why this is going on, but what I'm gonna focus on today are the two big ones, and those are climate change and land use change. So in terms of climate change, uh, if you read the papers or watch the news these days, we keep hearing over and over again, these fires are all the result of climate change. Climate change is making fires worse. And there's, there tends to be an assumption that climate change just linearly, unwaveringly is increasing fire everywhere. Um, and there have been studies that have done across, have been done across large regions that have shown um, relationships between, you know, drying and warming of the region associated with increasing fire. Um, However, my colleague John and I have been doing a lot of studies looking at much smaller regions. And what we found is that it's actually not everywhere. When you look at regions that are much smaller in size, we find that climate does not affect fire in the same ways and it doesn't affect it in the same amount. 
So these are results of some studies that we did where we looked at climate fire relationships across different regions in California. And we found in some areas, uh, like the montane forests, those areas that I was just talking about, if you look at seasonal climatic activity and relate it to seasonal or to annual fire activity, you see significant relationships and you see them in the way you would expect. Hotter spring and summer, more fire. You know, drier springs, you have more fire. Uh, snowpack decline is related to more fire. However, if you look at those same relationships in coastal shrublands of California, we found no relationships. Um, there was, you know, no significant effect of the direct seasonal climate variability on fire. And first I'll explain why. And that is that in Southern California, um, there's six months of drought because of the Mediterranean climate every year. So by the time the, the summer and fall roll around, everything is very dry. Um, there are lots of human caused ignitions. The low summer temperature in Southern California is the same as the high summer temperature in um, interior Northern California. So every single year, there's a potential for a lot of fire in Southern California. Climate is not making that, you know, qualitatively that much worse. However, there can be indirect effects. So long-term drought can cause, can cause dieback, which can make fires propagate faster. Um, we also see a relationship with previous year precipitation, and that's important because it can affect fires in the grasslands, and there are an increasingly um, widespread amount of annual grasslands um, in the southern part of the state. So what about the fires this year? Everybody wants to know why we had so much fire this year. And the first thing I'll say is that it's really complicated. Um, and we don't really know yet because we haven't done the research yet because the fires aren't even out yet. But um, we're pretty sure that climate was a player in some regards. Um, a lot of previous droughts resulted in excess tree mortality. Um, we had a dry winter and there were a couple of heat waves. But there's also factors that contribute um, that go beyond climate. So there was the lightning siege we had in the summer. And that's not an unpre it's rare, but it's not unprecedented in the state. A lot of the area burned occurred in very old vegetation, which may have been a legacy of previous forest management. Um, but, you know, some of the things that are really uncertain is that now all of this area may limit future fires. So one thing about climate change and fire is that vegetation is continually changing, not only as a result of fire, but also directly as a, as a result of climate change. And so that's a big wild card as we look into the future. And then there's other things that drive fires, winds, ignitions caused by humans, and land use, which I'm going to be talking about soon. Um, so it's complicated. And uh, just to continue with this topic of different fire climate relationships in different areas, we did a similar study across the entire United States looking at smaller regions and assessing the type and strength of relationships between climatic activity and fire activity. And we found across the states um, that there are different different kinds of climate drivers that are important in different areas, and the strength of the relationship varies. So if you look at these colors here, those areas in dark green have very strong relationships between climate and fire. Those areas in light green have almost no relationship between climate and fire. And we tried to understand, well, what is it that's different between these areas with strong or weak relationships between fire? We found that the single only variable that explained it is that those areas that had weak fire climate relationships had higher human presence. And so what this is suggesting is that humans can override the effects of climate because humans have many different ways that they can affect wildfire. Um, they start them, they put them out, they change the fuel, and they change the land use. And so this is what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. Uh, and I want to come back to the maps that I showed you before. 
Um, we looked at change over 60 years. We saw um, much more change in development than area burned and voila, we had a lot of structures lost. Uh, I put these charts together as well. So what we're looking at here is the boundary of the Tubbs fire on the left and the campfire boundary on the right. In this um, orangey color, you see um, the development that was there in the year 1940. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, flip the screen and you're gonna see the structures lost in the recent fires and you're also gonna see the development in the year 2010. So what we're looking at here, every place in the darker brown is new development that occurred since 1940. And the blue structures are structures that were destroyed in these fires. So clearly a lot of these structures that were destroyed occurred in areas that were newly developed since 1940. And one of my favorite quotes that I use in a lot of my talks is, well, what's the difference? What's the connection? And Roger Kennedy, who was with the Park Service once said, the problem isn't fire. The problem is people in the wrong places. And so I have spent um, more than 10 years at this point trying to understand why some structures are destroyed in fires and why some aren't. So I have been doing these studies by comparing um, the point locations of where structures have been destroyed in the past and comparing them to structures that were not destroyed in fires and trying to use a variety of statistical analyses to figure out what's the difference. And in Southern California, um, one of our first studies showed that the most significant factor explaining structure loss is the arrangement and pattern of housing development. And in particular, if you look at this map, which is just a screenshot on my GIS, the red area, the red dots are structures that had been destroyed and the blue were structures that were not destroyed. And you can see um, a lot of the typical patterns were sort of low to intermediate density of development, those structures that tend to be close to the edge of development, small clusters of development are also um, those that tend to burn more frequently. And in this study, uh, the pattern of housing explained more than anything else that we looked at. An important caveat to this though, is that even though overall low density housing um, leads uh, houses to be more exposed to fire to begin with, if a fire actually gets to a development and that development has really high housing density, you then have a flip problem where you can have structure to structure spread. So at that point, high density is a hazard. And um, this is what happened in Coffee Park. This is also what happened um, in a lot of the structures that burned in Paradise. Uh, this is just sort of a repeat. We did another study where we looked at the housing density of all structures versus destroyed structures um, in separate fires and also in three different regions in the state. And once again, we found that relatively speaking, um, the destroyed structures have much lower housing density than the background structures. Um, so another thing is that development pattern not only affects structure exposure to fire, but it affects fire itself. In California, most fires are caused by humans with the exception of lightning sieges like we had this year. And not surprisingly, most fires start near human infrastructure. So this is the Santa Monica Mountains. In red on the left, you see ignition points and they're close to roads, they're close to development. But what's interesting is that you would think, okay, so then the more people you have, the higher the fire frequency. But actually it starts to taper off and go down. So the highest fire frequency, and we've looked at this uh, across California, across the world's Mediterranean ecosystems, and other researchers have, since this study, gone on and confirmed the relationship in other parts of the world. It's a fairly robust relationship where fires are most frequent at intermediate levels of development. And the reason for this 
particularly in areas where humans cause most of the ignitions, if you have low housing density here over on the left, um, you don't have a whole lot of people to be starting fires. If you have really high housing density in population, you have a whole lot of people, but you don't have as much fuel. You also probably have access to faster suppression response. So this is why somewhere in the middle, there are plenty of ignitions, but there's also, you know, a lot more vegetation so that if an ignition starts, it can actually result in a fire that spreads and burns. And some of these areas are also more difficult to access for uh, suppression resources. Fire losses are also related to location. So it's not really surprising, but again, looking at the Santa Monica Mountains, and this is outdated, but the trend is exactly the same. There are certain par uh, parts of these mountains that tend to burn over and over and over again. Um, right now, if you look at this um, Malibu Canyon area, you've got you know 14 fires burning in the last 70 years. But on the other hand, there are places that have only burned once or maybe not even burned at all in the same area. So if you look at where structures have been destroyed um, versus where they haven't, it's not surprising that they have been in areas where fires tend to burn. You have to be exposed to the fire and have the fire before your structure is lost to a fire. Um, the other thing I wanna mention in terms of location, uh, my colleague Mark and I have been putting together some data looking at structure loss in different vegetation types in the state of California. These are preliminary data, uh, so they are not published anywhere yet. But what we found is that overall, um, we're looking at the area burned and fires that resulted in a structure loss. And you can see the vast majority of that is happening in shrublands. Um, also, if you look at the cumulative area burned between 2000 and 2018, um, overall, there's a lot more area burned in the state going on in shrubs than in any other vegetation type. But in particular, when you look at destructive fires, they are almost overwhelmingly occurring in the shrublands of the state. And so a lot of people, when they talk about fires in California, they think it's a forest fire problem. And there are fires in forests, but when you look at where structures are being destroyed, they're not being, some are being destroyed in the forest, but the vast majority are being destroyed in other vegetation types, particularly shrublands. So um, I'm gonna quickly talk about certain things that we can do about this new normal of wildfires in California. I put this uh, little cartoonish thing together because I wanted to illustrate that if you look at this one house, um, there are a whole range of factors that can come into play in terms of why the house can be destroyed. And there's a whole lot of things that can be controlled that affect the likelihood of this structure being destroyed. Um, anywhere from out in the landscape dealing with weather or uh, traditional fire management um, to things that are going on right at the house. And the main point before I even start is that house loss is a function of many factors. It's not just one thing. And to reduce housing loss in the future, you need multiple strategies. You need multiple tools. Um, just one isn't going to do it. But some may be more effective than others, and some may be more effective than others in different regions than others. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you think about fires destroying structures that almost all destructive fires are wind driven and most homes ignite by flying embers. These are tiny little millions, billions of embers that are flying through these really fast dry winds and any kind of nook or cranny in the house that they can get into is typically what starts the house on fire. Um, the traditional approach is vegetation management, such as fuel breaks. Um, and vegetation management has variable effects and effectiveness depending on where you are. In wind-driven fires, they typically don't stop the fire. 
Um, they can play a positive role if they are around communities and they provide a safe place for firefighters to get in um, to um, access suppression. But particularly in shrublands, there are ecological trade-offs um, because it really involves removing the woody cover and pretty much replacing it with annual grass, which tends to be very flammable. And just as a reminder, most of the structures destroyed are in these shrublands, not in forests. Um, we've done research looking at structural characteristics relative to structures being destroyed. Um, your house can, um, the way it's constructed and having different upgrades or retrofits can provide significant additional protection. Um, and you don't, I mean, it's expensive, and that's a lot of the argument for why people aren't retrofitting structures, particularly because there's so much existing development out there that's relatively old. But what we showed is that the most important factors at a statewide scale are having um, closed eaves or um, screens on your vents or having screens on any openings in your house. Window panes were also really important. And so if you don't have money to replace your roof or to get completely new siding, there are some things you can do by making sure you've got all the gaps and holes in your house um, covered up. Defensible space can also be beneficial. We've done studies um, looking at defensible space pre-fire and found that um, the most significant is effect is right adjacent to the structure. Um, it has a lot to do with the moisture of the vegetation or the leaves or debris that falls from the vegetation. Um, in several studies, we found no additional benefit by doing defensible space anywhere more than 100 feet. Um, and in fact, the most effective defensible space distance is somewhere between 50 and 75 feet. And the most effective distance is that five feet right around your house. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is that a lot of folks think that more is better. And insurance companies, for example, are requiring homeowners to clear 200, 300 feet from their house. But this not only doesn't provide significant additional protection, it can have unintended consequences. If you're in shrublands, and you clear all of your high fuel moisture woody vegetation and turn it into grass. And if you don't water that grass, you've got a highly flammable environment if embers land on that grass. So the alternative is land use planning. It's the difficult alternative. Um, some strategies might um, target housing and protection of structures, um, but they might have ecological costs. And we've done a lot of research trying to understand whether different land use planning decisions could address both, not only result in reduced fire risk to humans, but also have reduced impacts to ecological um, resources. So this is sort of the people in the wrong places argument. Um, People are the source of ignitions and house loss, and it's where they're located. So there's two different ways that you could go about land use decision making. One is through your traditional zoning that directly regulates where houses can be placed on the landscape and in what den density. But another idea is land acquisition for biodiversity protection. Um, people are still buying land and conserving it, and this indirectly displaces housing by restricting it and forcing it to go in other places. And we've done some simulation modeling experiments where we looked into the future and used fire risk models to project what the overall housing footprint of different development patterns would be and what the overall landscape risk to houses would be. And for this, we looked at three different types of development. So infill is filling in existing development, one is expanding out from existing development, and the other is sort of that leapfrog separate development. And we found that the infill type development overall had the lowest area of development on the landscape and also had the mean projected lowest landscape risk. We also ran a lot of scenarios looking at how to go about conserving land 
looking at you know, cost, area, location, et cetera. And we found that we could find mutual benefits for biodiversity and fire risk reduction if you were to purchase land either where there's existing high fire hazard or where areas have the high species richness. And the reason for that is because those are spatially correlated. The areas in, this is San Diego County, the 10 that have the highest fire hazard also have the highest species richness. So if you can buy land and prevent new development occurring in these areas, um, you're displacing it to other areas. And a lot of times you are, you know, resulting in infill. Um, these are all, you know, hypothetical scenarios and land use planning is much more complex than that, I understand. But these are just thoughts for the future. Um, so in summary, uh, what are the take-homes? I think a really important one is that fire regimes are altered differently. There are different fire regimes and one size does not fit all. There is no one normal. Multiple strategies are needed. Um, fuels management can be um, helpful in an appropriate context. Science-based homeowner actions are universally um, potentially beneficial for reducing community risk to fire. Climate change is important, but it's going to have variable effects and it's much more complicated than saying, oh yeah, climate's going to increase fire. And in some cases, humans may affect fire more than climate. And so in our conversations about climate change, it's important to not forget the human influence on fire. Land use is a primary explanation for housing loss, and that's primarily because it's just associated with, with development being exposed to fire in the first place. Um, ultimately, it is a variable that we can directly control. So ending up with uh, Pete Seeger and the um, to everything, turn, 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 there is a season. I suggest to you that the season to plan is now because a lot of the region that you're interested in still is not extensively developed. So you have the decision now where to place the new construction that goes in in the future. And that's it. Alex, thank you so much. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen. Um, excellent. And um, we're going to hopefully reduce the uh, number of folks on video here to just the um, presenters or the, the panel. But I'll, uh, I'll quickly uh, start to introduce the panel uh, members and then uh, we can start having some Q&A. Um, so in addition to, to Alexandra, we've got uh, Lenya Quinn Davidson, who's the Area Fire Advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension. Lenny is also co-chair of the Statewide University of California Fire Working Group and a member of the UC Oak Woodland Conservation Working Group. Her primary focus is on the human connection with fire, We're talking a lot about that today, and uh, increasing the use of prescribed fire for habitat restoration, invasive species control, ecosystem, and community resiliency. Thanks for being here, Lenny. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Frank Abley, who has been the Mendocino National Forest Upper Lake District Ranger since 2014 and recovery efforts there from the August complex fire from this year are now following those from the 2018 ranch fire. Water quality and habitat recovery are among the key issues that Frank and his team are working on. And then last but certainly not least is uh, our a good pal, Terry Shore, who is the advocacy director of the Greenbelt Alliance. Uh, she's a former mem member of the Redwood chapter of Sonoma Group's executive committee. And she's been at the helm of land use and conservation initiatives for many years and is a pillar of the Sonoma County environmental community. So thank you panelists for being here. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to uh, kind of take your, uh, the, the three non-presenters, um, just kind of get your feedback one at a time um, and I'll call on you. Um, what's your immediate kind of takeaways from the presentation? And uh, Lenya, can we start with you? Yeah, sure, can you hear me? Well, thanks for having me and thanks for the excellent presentation, Alex. Um, I guess my immediate takeaway is I, I really love the work that Alex has done on 
looking at climate and human interactions and how human management and the human relationship with our landscapes can actually override the influence of climate. Um, that's something I use in a lot of talks that I give. There's been some work specific to the Sierra Nevada along those same lines. And um, I just think it's a really empowering message. I think we, we can be very overwhelmed by the climate context and the fire context. And if we can keep that in mind, that if we have a close relationship no matter which landscape we live on or what kind of habitat type we're in, if we're in tune with it and we're actually actively managing it and thinking about the future we want with it, that we do have the power to, to create that to some extent. So um, that's my initial reaction. Excellent presentation. Super. Frank, uh, how, about, how about your thoughts next? Hey, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. And thanks for having me. Uh, great presentation, Alexandra. I had a, a couple of thoughts. And uh, it's interesting when you look at the, uh, the relationship between development and the cost of fires and the destructiveness of fires. Uh, I'll go back. One, one thing you probably all don't know about me is prior to my life with the Forest Service, I used to wor actually work in floodplain development. And it's the same relationship, right? Uh, they always had floods. We've always had big floods. They've just become more destructive because we started building in flood-prone areas. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as we, as you know, when you look at land management planning, there may be some uh, lessons to be learned from the flood development programs, National Flood Insurance Program, and, and those types of things. Uh, in fact, I actually used to, I, I don't like to say this, but I used to draw and, and, and create a lot of the National Flood Insurance Program as for California, that was my area, uh, so very well, uh, know it very well. Um, one other quick thought I had is the, the one of the human interaction and the, the impact on development on, an, on the size of fires that, that I've seen personally here with the ranch fire in the August complex is when you have limited resources and fires threatening communities, those resources are obviously gonna to go to those communities and the fire is gonna be left unchecked out in the wildlands uh, because yeah. that you, you just have to protect the communities. Yeah. And so as, as those communities increase and they become more threatened, you're gonna see a lot more wildlands burn just due to limited resources. Those kind of and if you have scattered contracts. houses out in that wildland, it's also going to, you know, go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Super. And Terry, uh, certainly uh, welcome your comments on the presentation. Well, first of all, I want to say that I'm thrilled to be on the panel with Alexandra Sifford. Um, we met shortly after the 2017 uh, Tubbs and Nuns fire in Sonoma County. Uh, we met through the Nature Conservancy when they pulled a few of us together to talk about transfer of development rights as a land use tool to reduce the number of people of harm's way in the WUI. And um, at that time, I had never heard of the WUI. Uh, until a reporter called me and asked me what I thought about development in the WUI. Um, so since then, like so many of us, I've learned so much about wildfire and the WUI um, as we've had fire after fire after fire. And um, one of the most important revelations that I had uh, was Alexandra's work, and in particular what Greenbelt Alliance has been calling the Sifford Curve. And your research was just incredible in finding that the highest risk factor for loss of life and home to wildfire, more than topography, more than fuel load, more than home building materials or defensible space in general is the arrangement of homes in medium density, scattered in the rural communities in these fire prone landscapes. So, um, uh, that has really driven a lot of our thinking, and when we get to the Q&A, I'm going to ask, him, ask some follow-up questions about that stunning uh, research, so thank you. Could I say something? <laughs> um, just a correction. Uh, my last name is pronounced Seiford. Okay. Seiford curve. Okay. Seiford. Just, you know, in case people are 
talking, you can correct them too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Most people sure. want to say Sifford, and um, it just is pronounced differently than what it looks like. Okay. So, Super. Thanks. Well, uh, we've had some great uh, questions in the chat box. And for folks who are still on, if you have any additional questions, uh, it, it would be great for you to populate them there. But um, uh, similar to last Friday's presentation, there is also a facilitator's preference on which question gets asked first. So um, uh, I am fascinated, as uh, someone put this in the chat box, I'm fascinated by the, uh, by the ciphered curve uh, as well. Um, and and the methodology behind it. One of the one of our participants um, asked about insurance companies and their level of analysis. And uh, if you or if you know of others who have been in touch with uh, insurance companies with this kind of analysis information, because it seems like there would be some, uh, you know, both insurers and reinsurers. You know, the the million dollars and up. Um, um, uh, risk uh, uh, folks who would be interested in this information, especially as this expands, as our challenges expand in the West here? Well, um, I actually am the chief scientist for an insurance company, um, even though uh, it's, a, it's a progressive model in that they are using science to, um, to develop their pricing and analytics and policies. So I keep my role as a research scientist and I just give them scientific information. But I will say that insurance is challenging in California because um, risk models are not allowed to be used to develop rates for the admitted market. And that is because uh, folks are concerned that if people use risk models, and identify areas that are super high at risk, they're gonna drop a whole lot of policies. Of course, the insurance companies are already dropping a whole lot of policies. It's very complicated. But, um, you know, I think that in general, in the long term, as the science advances, as more folks begin to, you know, I think ultimately the models are going to improve. A lot of the insurance companies have been using relatively crude fire models, and I think they're overall um, becoming more sophisticated. So I think that you are correct in that maybe not in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10 years, um, insurance companies will have an indirect land use effect on fire and that just simply there's going to be a disincentive to live in dangerous places because it's going to be so expensive to insure your home. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel on that? Okay. Um, the couple of questions uh, regarding uh, fires and how they are positioned. You mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the, the uh, complex you know, um, definition and that that was actually made up of multiple fires. Um, and I, and, you know, and maybe Frank is, is able to um, weigh in on, on this also. How, what's the methodology as far as, um, and maybe it's just a naming thing, but it turns into almost a marketing problem in some ways. Uh, you know, the largest fire in California history uh, is made up of multiple smaller fires, but, um, some feedback on that and, and what do you think are there ramifications to that or is it uh, tempest in a teapot? I'm guessing you called out on me so sure. uh, really there I don't think there's any kind of uh, financial uh, gain for doing that normally you complex a, 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 a group of fires it's more about the span of control and suppression efforts you have, uh, you know, a number of resources. Um, it, it really boils down to like the logistics. You have a certain number of resources to battle several fires. And for example, the August complex, when you have five or six fires spread out across a very large area, and you can see that they're going to start to merge together or that, that the resources are spread really thin to battle those fires or to manage those fires, then you bring in a, you, you complex them so that one, they're under a single management team that can move resources from one fire to another much more easily than if you had separate 
incidents because uh, when you have separate incidents, people have to be released from one incident to be moved to another incident. Once it's complex, they can be moved around very freely on that complex. And so it's really about um, making it easier to manage the fire and making it easier logistically to uh, support people out there managing the fire. Uh, you don't have to have multiple vendors supplying food to the firefighters. You can have one vendor doing all the fires in that complex. So it it's really comes down to the trying to reduce the complexity of the logistics and the management. And there is the financial part of it is in the end, it's easier to account for the finances in it. You know, you have one complex, everybody's charging to one code. Uh, all the charges are going to one fire. And so it's easier to track that than it is to track everybody charging to different fires. And so the, that's really the, 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 you know, what I understand is the, the best benefit of complexing. Gotcha. Thank you for that. I think that the, the, that's a great answer. Um, a couple of questions on the density um, uh, challenge and, you know, the topography type for the area. Um, how do you see, um, and, and this is kind of thrown out to you guys, but maybe Alex, you can start. Uh, how do you see the, the density problem uh, in our region, um, you know, based on based on the last map or two that you showed, you know, we've got some opportunities still here in, in Northwest California as far as lack of development. Um, are there specific uh, strategies? I mean, we have some levels of authority with, depending on whether it's a board of supervisors in the unincorporated area or within the city limits in some cases. Um, would there be policy development or land use policy development that would be a recommendation to um, those local uh, uh, units of government? So I would say in general, um, I have several thoughts. Uh, you know, in general, development that is clustered that has reduced edge is going to be the best bet because really, you, you know, you think about as much edge as you have between houses and flammable vegetation, that's just more exposure. So when you have clustered developments that, you know, are within, you know, a larger area, that's overall the safest. Um, I've, there's been a few developments recently being proposed in which they are arguing, they're using my research to um, argue for their development, but what they're actually doing is putting a small cluster of development out in the wildland. So it's essentially a leapfrog, but in that cluster, it's very high density. And so they're saying, well, according to the Seifert curve, <laughs> which I've never heard before, um, you know, this is great because it's high density, but um, you know, actually, it's one of the most dangerous patterns because not only are you exposed because you have vegetation all around you, but if the fire gets to you, you do have that high density, so you could have structure to structure spread. Um, but the other point I'd like to make is that, you know, um, every region is different and it isn't just the housing density. So it's housing density and topography and vegetation conditions. And so it's just, if somebody is really seriously going to take on planning for fire and it would be wonderful if they did, um, it's important to consider that there's multiple things that need to be accounted for and that each region is gonna differ from one to the next. Terry. Yeah, thank yeah, you. For that. I'd love to comment on that because um, land use policy is really Greenbelt's uh, bread and butter. And I mean, we are fortunate in Sonoma County in the North Bay that we already have some land legacy land use policies in place that we can continue to build on, specifically, um, you know, voter approved urban growth boundaries. Uh, voter approved uh, community separator green belts between our towns and cities. Um, those are very helpful and everything I've read about reducing wildfire risk um, points to that type of 
uh, growth, um, which is also climate smart and climate resilient. So it's kind of a win-win, mm -hmm. but we do see the push um, to develop in uh, more in the WUI and um, to put um, new, you know, uh, granny units up in the hills to address the housing crisis. And, and, you know, we don't think that's the best way to go, but there certainly is a lot of pressure. So, I mean, one question I had for you, um, Alexandra, is have you seen any model policies in the state or in the West um, that would address um, those issues about um, and moderate the development in the WUI in some way? Well, uh, I have seen, I have known of two policies that have either been in place or almost are in place. And those are in Marseille, France and Catalonia in Spain. Um, but I do know that Sonoma County, um, and you probably know um, Lisa, Michelle, and so I know they're yes. working on something to actually try to get um, fire into the planning. I, I don't know that much about it. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't have a model policy because... I don't know of a policy that's actually ever been developed. So uh, along those uh, similar lines, um, uh, we got a, a note from uh, Pete Parkinson, I think, who's the president of uh, the National Planning Directors Association. Um, last year, a Cal Fire Chief in San Diego region testified that a proposed development would actually reduce wildfire hazard due to introduction of WUI compliant homes and other hardscape. So, you know, the, the hard home hardening, can you comment on, on that and, and how much of a role do you think that plays? And I know there's, it depends, right, is part of the answer, but um, that might yeah. be talk about. I've heard, I've heard this argument a lot um, because it's, it's really the line that most of the new development companies are taking is, well, this is a fire safe neighborhood because we're gonna have fire stations, we're gonna have, you know, water, we're gonna have the most, you know, up-to-date building regulations, we're gonna have defensible space. And to that, I will say, of course, all of those things increase the odds that a structure can survive a fire. But if you, um, and I have looked at the structures that have been destroyed in recent fires, many of those structures have been brand new development. So, um, and I, I spent, uh, I, I have a lot of Australian colleagues and I spent some time with the folks who specialize in building construction in Australia. And something that's very different between them and us is that they will never say that a house is fire safe because they know a house can burn down. So it does increase the odds, but it's it's not a panacea. And I, I worry primarily because, um, you know, with those communities, it's also really important to have egress um, because when it comes down to it, people's lives are so much more important than their house. And a lot of people get in trouble because they're at the last minute, they think they're safe and they try to escape and, you know, they're in their car because they can't go anywhere. So um, I just, I, I worry about folks getting a false sense of security um, because building construction, while it is beneficial, um, you know, you think about the temperatures that a lot of these fires get. I mean, they melt metal. So, you know, you can't necessarily build yourself completely out of it. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and just a clarification, uh, Pete dropped us a line. He, he's um, actually the past president of the California chapter of the American Planning Association. So sorry for the misnomer there, Pete. Um, Couple of questions uh, again for the for the full panel. Whoever feels like jumping in here, um, you know, so much of um, so many Californians already live in a wooey area. Uh, you know, how uh, how do we see? How do you guys see 
management of those of existing developments and um you know alex the the expansion from 1940 through 2010 um you know what are what do you think are are some solutions or or some strategies around what already exists beyond what may happen in the future well um you know as i was saying building construction can be beneficial and as i was talking about in the presentation retrofits can be super expensive but you know i th i don't think you should take a binary um approach to that because there are things you can do so anything you can do you know to to make your house safer is is important and so you know the the actual homeowner can play a pretty big role in doing little things like you know keeping the debris away from your house uh, one of the most important things is irrigation the embers tend to go out and extinguish when they land on something that's green um, another thing that I didn't talk about in my presentation is the importance of ignition prevention. Um, you know, the, the reason that large fires happen under wind conditions is not because of the wind conditions. It's because a an ignition happens to coincide its synchronous in time and space with the wind conditions. So in addition to home interactions to make their community more resilient, um, just, you know, folks, there's many different ways you can go about ignition prevention from all different levels, you know, including to the neighborhoods patrolling. But that's something I'm just giving lip service to because I don't think a lot of folks are listening or they don't, they had, they, they don't really think about it that often. But, um, but it's a pretty big deal and the power lines are, are learning that. Um, and they're, they're very much focused on ignition prevention right now. And, and again, I would think, uh, you know, we've, we've got some uh, chat box activity, just, you know, you, if you do it, but your neighbor doesn't, um, th that's not as helpful, right? As if you've got kind yeah, of right. support. Exactly. So, and you the know, thing is that, you know, you have to just understand that you're in California. There's a lot of existing development in very fire prone areas and you're at risk um, and, and there's going to be a fire. So, you know, this might sound bad, but as I was saying before, um, evacuate, you know, um, your life is the most important thing. So... I know that's an event time response, but uh, if it happens, you know, make sure you have appropriate insurance and make sure you know you're ready, you know, make sure you've got your bags packed, make sure you're aware. Do everything you can, but make sure you're aware so that if the fire does come, you can get out safely. Yeah. Um, from, um, yeah you, I, might add, I might yeah. add something there. Um, I just think it's important. I don't know where the audience, um, you know, where folks are coming from who are on this webinar, but I do think we haven't really talked at all about fuels management or like the landscape scale activities that we could be taking to reduce risk as well. And that certainly plays a role, especially in a lot of our Northern California um, ecosystem and fuel types. So I think, I think it's important to remember that too, and to know that we can use fuels management strategies strategically, um, if you know, if we're actually thinking about the timing and the location and really being strategic with, um, with prescribed fire, with, with thinning, um, we can create fuel limited fire conditions. And I, I so I, I just think it's important. We, you know, in Sonoma County, around Redding, a, a lot of the areas where we've had really devastating fires are in grass and shrub fuel types. And, there are things we can do to mitigate risk in those systems, but we have to do it in a way that, that actually makes sense from a fuels perspective and thinking about ignitions and the time of year and things like that. So I wanted to throw that out there because I feel like we haven't mentioned that really at all. Yeah, in some, 
in some ecosystems, there really is, you know, there really has been anomalous fuel accumulation. The mix, the dry mix conifer forests of the Sierra Nevada um, could definitely benefit from prescribed fire and thinning. Um, so I, I'm just saying that I, I agree. Um, and strategic breaks that uh, facilitate fire suppression um, activities. So, you know, there, I, you know, there are things, especially in forested ecosystems. Yeah, but I think also in, in grass types and, and also just thinking about the, the change that's happened over time, you know, as we've taken things like grazing and prescribed fire out of these systems and to really reduce the agricultural lands around communities. That's something that I think is kind of interesting. I think about in Sonoma County or in Shasta County where you used to have communities that were then surrounded by ag lands that then butted up against chaparral or forest, and that provided a buffer. And in a lot, in many ways, we've lost that because of a conversion to to you know to chaparral, or um, really seen an infill and a, a type change in some of those places. But I think even in a, in a grass in an area where it's dominated by grass, I've been thinking a lot about how little we use spring burning in grass systems to buffer communities. I think there's a lot of unexplored opportunity to do strategic prescribed fire in grass fuel types, um, you know, before fire season. And we tend to do most of our burning, especially in Northern California in the fall, which doesn't do a lot in grass for the following year. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um... You know, grass is extremely hazardous because it's the most flammable um, fuel type. It burns very quickly um, when it's windy. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard statistics before where most firefighters have died in grass fires. And so um, definitely, I think, you know, if you have grass, some way to reduce the biomass of that grass through prescribed fire, um, mm -hmm. If it's not going to be irrigated, then then definitely, because some of that grass gets really tall and it's a huge hazard. So and and that's actually you know in in Southern California, what I worry about is the conversion of the high fuel yeah. moisture into the grasses because then you <laughs> you get that. So I I'm in total agreement with you. Uh, other panelists, Frank, do you want to uh, maybe touch on uh, shaded fuel breaks and any other strategies like that that the uh, the, the Forest Service has been implementing, implementing in the region? I know that, um, uh, you know, the, there's a broad, in, a, in the Redwood region, we've got a number of, of counties in the southern part of our territory, Sonoma, Napa, um, that are uh, more private property and uh, we're much heavier in, in public lands percentage in Trinity, Shasta, Siskiyou, Mendo, and Humboldt. Um, so any any kind of thought, thoughts on roadside shaded fuel breaks or anything like that would be uh, interesting, Frank. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think it was mentioned, it really comes down to strategically placed fuel breaks and strategically placed fuels management practices. Um, you know, as, as a public land management agency, we have to manage for multiple resources as, you know, wildlife habitat, you know, um, and of course, you know, fuels management. So it really comes down to uh, where are you going to do, where are you going to put the most of your money uh, to protect communities? Where are you going to put the heaviest treatment? So you may treat adjacent to a community much heavier uh, and thin it out much more and not lean too much more towards the wildlife conservation side of things. Uh, and then interior, you may lean more, more towards providing more wildlife habitat. And one of the um, kind of the uh, dichotomies in Northern California, especially in Northern Spotted Owl habitat, right, is uh, ladder fuels. Uh, firefighters will call them ladder fuels. Wildlife biologists will call them multi-storied canopies. And they're extremely important to the northern spotted owl, but you you really don't want a multi-story canopy in a wildland urban interface. You really want something that's open, where the fire will fire will drop to the ground and be easier to contain as it approaches the community. Uh, we saw that in the ranch fire in one of our treatments above Nice and Lucerne in Lake County, where we did uh, a very intensive uh, logging and thinning operation. And even some of our most um, 
I'd say supportive people like, wow, that, that looks like it was thinned a little too much. Uh, but when the ranch fire hit it, it dropped to the ground and, you know, the firefighters were able to stop it from getting into Lucerne and, and Nice. And so it, it's, you know, it, it, what we did there was really uh, more of a shaded fuel break, but on an area basis, it wasn't linear. There were strategic units placed along the ridge top and along the mid slope area of the ridge top where we thinned it to what would probably be considered a, a shaded fuel break. So that when that fire hit there, it, it dropped to the ground and, and it, could be, it could be managed a lot better. Um, going back to the grasses, yeah, they're an extremely flashy fuel. They, they burn hot, they burn fast. Um, but if you have the resources in place and a fuel break in place on that grassy slope, you're probably much more likely to catch it than you would a running crown fire in a timbered forest land. So it, it, it's fast, it's hot, but it, it's, it doesn't burn at 50 to 80 foot flame lengths. It burns at 10 to 20 foot flame lengths and it's a little more easier to manage. So there's definitely a lot of trade-offs there. And it's, it's, you know, it's something to consider as you look at land development. And I guess what we're talking about, what I'm talking about is the wildland part of the urban interface, and what we can do to protect communities. And we're always, it's always our number one priority uh, when we do a vegetation treatment in and around a community. Thank you for all of that, Frank. Just a couple of more minutes left. I know a few folks have four or five, uh, or in Alexander's case, eight. Um, so thank you for being here from the East Coast also. Um, what, one other uh, uh, quick question, um, and for, for any of the panelists here, we don't have a representative from Cal Fire here, and um, who is the, you know, on a, from a private property standpoint, and also, um, uh, uh, the, usually uh, is either um, on point or assisting with the response, regardless of, of the land ownership. Um, any interaction with CAL FIRE and, and any thoughts on their level of thought process on these issues as far as uh, land use, resources, response? Um, just, just kind of throwing that question out there to the panel. I think Cal Fire is a is a really diverse, you know. Um, I think about folks like Dave Sapsis in the in the GIS mapping, and I mean he's, you know, um, his role is very different than the the folks who are out doing the building inspections versus the folks who are planning the policies for the vegetation management and so um, I don't really have a big uh, handle on a, a cow fire overall um, policy um, you know I the folks I've interacted with have all been super great and knowledgeable but uh, yeah. Go ahead, Lania. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, they, they, there are a lot of different facets in CAL FIRE, but ultimately they are our state fire department. You know, they are charged with putting fires out. And so that's, that is their number one priority. And they're not a land management agency. They manage very few pieces of actual ground. So though they have programs that either fund or facilitate some level of management, like their vegetation management program, or prescribed fire or their CFIT program that provides funding to private landowners to do forest management work. Um, that's really not their biggest area of emphasis. And so um, they culturally as an agency, they, they really are quite good at putting fires out right away and on prioritizing that and as, as they should. Um, so it's always like this, this kind of trick, you know, they're a lot different than like Frank with the Forest Service where they're actually managing land and, and have yeah. to have a bigger vision about what that landscape looks like and how to make it more resilient. That's not really Cal Fire's wheelhouse. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and in some some ways, I mean, the decisions we're all making locally are gonna immediately impact um, Cal Fire um, because the, you know if they are that response entity, um, they're responding to our behavior more than anything. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, they're there to pick up the pieces, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, well, panelists, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the Redwood chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, fascinating, uh, great discussion, and uh, I, we would love to, to rope you all back into so, to future discussions as well. And Alex, thank you so much for the presentation. Just oh, thanks, uh, for, thanks for having me. Fantastic information, and, and um, you know, I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. I had a great time. So, all right, everybody, thanks so much for the time, and uh, we'll see you soon. We'll have, uh, we're going to do another um, edition of this ongoing conversation sometime in January, so stay, stay tuned for the info on that. And thanks again to Greenbelt Alliance for co-sponsoring the event. Okay.